Welcome back. It's time for another worked example. This time we're going to be measuring the orbital properties of an extrasolar planet. This example requires the concepts of rotational motion and gravitation. By the way, the data for this example comes from a paper that's described at the bottom of this slide. But more about that in a moment. Let's look at a demo to clarify the situation. Okay, I've cooked up a demo here where we have a planet orbiting a star. You can see the center mass of the planet is tracing out this red ring here. What I want to do is to zoom in a little bit on the star so that you can see the center mass of the star in here is actually tracing out this little ring in the middle. The star is moving only very slightly relative to the planet. It's got a very tiny wobble, but it wobbles enough that very clever astronomers can actually detect the wobble. They can see the fact that the star is moving by looking at the very tiny shift of the wavelengths of light that are produced by the star. So what I want to point out also is that um, there's a lovely website called exoplanets.org and you can actually go there and learn about all the extrasolar planets that have been discovered, thousands of them at this point. The particular one we're going to be looking at this time, let's see if he's listed here. Uh, here it is, 219828B, and uh, you can actually go to the original cited reference for that guy and download the full article. So, that's pretty fun. And uh, we're going to take the data from this particular article and use it to solve this problem. There you have it. Again, the name of that website is exoplanets.org. If you look at the original discovery paper for this exoplanet, there's a bunch of data there that we need in order to do this calculation. So the first thing we need is the mass of the star. It turns out by looking at the spectrum of a star, astronomers can determine its spectral type and its luminosity class. Taking those two numbers together, we can determine that this particular star is on the main sequence, which means it's burning hydrogen like our sun, and they can take all that information and determine the mass of the star. It turns out this one is about a little shy of 25% more massive than our own sun. The other thing they need is the a period and amplitude of the wobble. So by looking at the light from the star, they can see that it's Doppler shifted to the red and to the blue periodically. And from that Doppler shift, they determined that the period of this star, the wobble of this star, was 3.8 days. And that the amplitude of the wobble, the speed of the star at its maximum deviation, was 7 meters a second. That's amazing. 7 meters a second for a star that's light years away. Anyway, with those three numbers, we can do the calculation. Let's take that data and put it into a, a framing that you might find in a homework problem at the end of a chapter in your textbook. Astronomers observe a 1.24 mass solar mass star wobbling with a period of 3.8 days. By analyzing the star spectrum, they deduce that the maximum velocity of its wobble is about 7 meters a second. Assuming that the planet's orbit is edge-on, the planet's mass is a small fraction of the star's mass, and that the orbit is circular, estimate the mass of the planet and its orbital distance from the star. Let's talk about that edge-on business. So uh, when I started the demo, we were looking down on top of the orbit, kind of like this, and notice if that was the true orientation of the orbit relative to the Earth's point of view, there would be no wobble measurable at all, because the wobble of the star would be in the plane of the orbit and we're looking in a direction perpendicular to that, so the star would not be moving toward or away from us at all. So in order to make this thing easier to measure, the best situation is if the orbit is actually in the same plane as our line of sight. So to make this problem simpler, we're going to assume that's the case. Furthermore, real astronomers have to worry about the fact that the orbit might not be exactly circular, and um, we're not going to worry about that either. We'll pretend like, well, we're going to assume that the orbit is circular. And uh, it turns out in this case, it pretty nearly is. But let's just march ahead using those simplifying assumptions.
First, I'm going to draw a physics picture of the situation. I've got a star, I've got an exoplanet, and I've got the center of mass. Now, I'm going to exaggerate the distance between the star and the center of mass to make the picture clear. We'll see in a moment that the distance between the star and the center of mass is actually quite small. So, the orbits of the two objects, they each orbit the center of mass with the same period. So, what that means is that the star moves a smaller distance than the planet in the same period of time. Now, that's going to have consequences we'll see here in a moment. Let's put some labels on things. First of all, the star has a mass and the planet has a mass. We're going to assume the star is much more massive than the planet, so I'm going to label the star's mass capital M and the planet's mass little m. Similarly, the distance between the star and the center of mass is small. The distance between the planet and the center of mass is large. So I'm going to call the star center of mass distance little r and the planet to center of mass distance big R. As I was saying, you can see now very clearly that in the same period of time, the star moves around a circumference that's quite small, the planet moves around a much larger circumference, and since they uh, orbit these distances in the same period of time, it means the velocities must be also proportional. Let's talk about dynamics. The basic dynamics of basically any mechanics problem is the momentum principle, or Newton's second law. The rate of change of the momentum is equal to the net force. The rate of change of momentum in this case is just the mass times the acceleration. Because we're talking about circular motion, what's the acceleration got to be? Right, it's got to be v squared over r. So the mass of the planet times its acceleration is equal to the mass of the star times its acceleration, which is equal to the net force. The point is, you could focus on either the star or the planet they both experience the same force because of Newton's third law, which says that the force on the planet by the star must equal the magnitude of the force on the star by the planet. As far as kinematics goes, the fundamental idea here is that the, each of the objects orbits the center of mass. The center of mass is defined in such a way that the mass of the star times its orbital radius is equal to the mass of the planet times its orbital radius. If I multiply both sides of that guy by omega, I've got to still have a good equation. But remember what omega is. It's 2 pi divided by the period of the orbit. It's the angle divided by the time, uh, the angle per unit time. And uh, in this case, that's 2 pi radians for one orbit divided by the time for one orbit. Now notice what we've got here. 2 pi little r is the circumference of the sun's orbit divided by the time and then on the other side, we've got 2 pi big R, that's the orbit, the circumference of the planet's orbit divided by time. So what we really have is the velocity of the planet and the velocity of the star. So if you put that together, you get that the mass of the planet times its velocity has the same magnitude as the mass of the star times its velocity. In other words, the momentum of the planet moving to the left must be equal to the momentum of the star moving to the right. Now that seems obvious if you think about it, because we know that the whole system has no momentum at all. And the only way that can be is if the two momenta are actually equal and opposite. Another point that I'd like to bring out is that if you look at the data that we have, we know the speed of the star's wobble, and we know the period of the star's wobble. So the only thing we don't know in this expression is the radius of the star's orbit. So we can actually immediately deduce the star's orbital radius, and it works out to be 366 kilometers. Now that might sound like a lot, but hang on a minute because in a little while we'll calculate the orbital radius of the planet and we'll see how it compares. Let's push on the dynamics a little bit. <clears throat> we know that uh, the velocity of the planet is omega times r, so let's put that in and then simplify a little bit. We get m omega squared r is equal to the net force on the planet. But what's that got to be? Well, of course, that's produced by the gravitational force acting between the star and the planet. We put in Newton's universal law of gravitation, and we notice right away that the mass of the planet actually cancels out. So the orbital uh, period and the <coughs> angular velocity of the planet going around the star 
turns out to be independent of the mass of the planet. At least, uh, well, as you can see. So, uh, the other thing I want to say is that if little r is indeed much, much smaller than big R, then it means that we can neglect the little r in the denominator over here. Now, we'll see in a moment whether that's justified or not, but let's just go ahead and do it and see what happens. You'll notice now we've got an r in the numerator on the left-hand side and an r squared in the denominator on the right-hand side. We can solve for big R and calculate its value because we know the mass of the star, we know the period of the orbit, and of course we know Newton's universal gravitational constant. So let's put all that in there. We'll calculate omega, 2 pi divided by 3.8 days, and put that in the formula that we just cooked up from the uh, dynamics, and we get the orbital radius is almost 8 million kilometers. Now that sounds like a lot until you remember that the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 150 million kilometers. So this actually works out only to be about 5% of an astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So this planet is actually quite close to its star. But remember that the distance between the star and its center of mass is a mere 366 kilometers. So the star is much, much closer to the center of mass than the planet. Now we can take the center of mass relationship, the kinematics we worked out earlier, and notice that we have the mass of the star, we have the star's distance from the center of mass, we now have the planet's distance from the center of mass. The only thing we're missing is the mass of this extrasolar planet. So we can now solve this guy for the mass of the extrasolar planet, it turns out to be about 19.6 Earth masses. So it's much more massive than the Earth, almost 20 times more massive than the Earth, and it's much closer to its star. So let's see how that compares to the result from the paper. Well, with their sophisticated analysis, they came up with 19.8 Earth masses. So I think we did all right.